and what's potentially the next metal that China could could target here in terms of trying to really kind of, you know, get get the U.S. kind of hit, hit them where it hurts. Right. So it's not to say that they're going to ban the, the exports of tungsten. But if you look at some of those data points and some of those numbers, it's quite scary. Uh, the position that the U.S. is in because they're so reliant on China. And that's where we ultimately think we can fit in here is we have the largest undeveloped project. It's on U.S. soil. It's in Nevada. It's relatively close to production. The capex is relatively low. So we think it's a really it's a home run of a story. Today's guest is a supporting sponsor of Liberty and Finance. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this returning guest, Oliver Friesen, whom you met before when we interviewed him at the Rule Symposium on Natural Resources Investing in Boca Raton, Florida, is also the CEO of Golden Metal Resources, a almost brand spanking new company, but it is newly uh, listed on the OTC market. And he's here to talk with us about some pretty dramatic events that may be unfolding in the tungsten, graphite, and related strategic materials markets. Oliver, thanks for coming back to join us on again on Liberty and Finance. Yeah, great to chat again, Danny. I'm looking forward to catching up here on tungsten and gold metal resources. So that's something that our viewers are keenly interested in. Uh, we have Rick Rule on our channel approximately once a month. He he answers rapid fire viewer submitted questions to help us understand his viewpoint on where we're at in major trends that are unfolding in our geopolitical and natural resource world. One of the biggest themes in that arena right now and for the last couple of years has been the concern about strategic materials. Um, many things have happened over the past several decades that my career in engineering was the big watchword was offshoring and just in time and global supply chains. And there was this brilliance and uh, back padding that was going on with people who could save a dime by uh, making sure that you source things from the very cheapest location in the world. And no matter what it took to get it over to you, that would all happen just in time. We've seen enough disruptions in the last three years, not just logistically, but also geopolitically, that people are seriously concerned right now, and countries are getting seriously concerned about domestic sources and lowering the risk to strategic materials. You've got an eye on that, and you're playing a role in that. Can you talk to us about, you mentioned to me that you just returned from a conference on tungsten, and most of us are familiar with tungsten from filaments and light bulbs and maybe not much else. So if you could enlighten us on why tungsten and other materials like graphite are not only strategic, but could be at risk of uh, interruptions in global supply because of whether it's supply chain or geopolitical concerns. No, you nailed it there, Don, again. So I think that's a really good overview. And, and the, the, you know, the main metal that we're focused on at our company is tungsten. But I think if you just step back a little bit, I think what's happened over the last, I would say, 20, 30 years um, to kind of get us into this mess is ultimately the Western world, United States, I'm from Canada originally, we've shot ourselves in the foot. You know, we have lots of great exploration and mining projects, but we've not allowed them to go through the necessary steps to get those products to market. And in that time, you know, the, the likes of China and Russia have, have happily allowed us to do that. And effectively, they've been pushing forward mining and exploration in their own countries. And now that's led us to a point where China and Russia have a complete stranglehold on the supply chain of a lot of really, really important input metals. And the way that's manifesting itself now is in the, the wake of the Russia-Ukraine war, Russia started to weaponize some of these supply chains, knowing that you know US and, and UK and Europe and Canada are reliant on them for a lot of these really imp important commodities. And now as things continue to kind of ratchet up and geopolitical you know, concerns and tensions continue to, to build, what we're seeing now is China who ultimately has these the the, the I, I, you, you know China has the strongest um, supply chain um, built out of, of a lot of these really important input metals, including you know rare earth elements, graphite as you discuss, and tungsten is another one where China has a complete control on that supply chain. And what they're starting to do, starting to do now is curb exports or completely ban exports of these metals to the United States as tensions continue to rise. So that's a really um, you know, scary position for the U.S. to be in right now. But what that ultimately has led to is the U.S. saying, OK, enough is enough. We need to support domestic and homegrown mining. We have so many great projects, 
But now is the time to step up and support these projects, either through funding, through you know, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Department of Minerals, et cetera, et cetera, um, and also shortening permitting timelines. So we fit in very nicely to that to that sort of developing narrative. Um, and, and the way we do that is we own the largest undeveloped tungsten deposit on U.S. soil. And that project is located in the very mining friendly state of Nevada. And just to give you a few data points and your listeners and a few data points on tungsten specifically, so the United, uh, China currently controls 86% of total global annual supply of tungsten. So they control the, maj- the vast majority of tungsten and, and they mine most of that and, and essentially can determine which countries get access to that metal. On top of that, United States currently has zero domestic primary production. So there's no active primary tungsten mines in the U.S., which means obviously the U.S. is a net importer of the metal. And as you guess, or as you can probably guess, their major and, and most important import partner of tungsten comes from China. So once again, that's a position that the United States cannot be in because one of the main reasons, and as you mentioned, it's using filaments, that's kind of the old school use of it, but it's using a lot more high tech, high technology um, use cases today, including uh, in nuclear fusion, a really important developing technology. It's used in drilling bits in the oil and gas and mining industry. Um, but I think most importantly for listeners is the fact that about 10% of tungsten makes its way into the defense industry. So right now, the U.S. Department of Defense is effectively reliant on China for their tungsten imports. And as of January 1st, 2026, the DOD has said, "Okay, we're banning the import of tungsten from China for DOD procurement. But there's no there's no supply to fill that gap. But here we are with, you know, the the, the largest undeveloped tungsten project on U.S. soil. It's 100 percent owned. Um, we're working closely and trying to to access some of these grants that are available through the DOD or other U.S. departments to allow us to fast track this project through exploration and development with the ultimate goal of this tungsten entering directly into the U.S. supply chain and going to the, the different parties in the U.S. that need this very, very important metal. We've been cautioned by not only Rick Rule, but, um, for example, uh, Keith Newmeyer from First Majestic Silver and others that the neglect that you described for decades in the U.S. of exploration and development of many uh, different uh, mining uh, resources could take decades again to recover from. And that's following the uh, normal timeline of development of large-scale mining operations and infrastructure related to that and everything. You're talking about potentially a much faster process uh, if it can unfold. Is there any uh, desired or target timeline that that your company is looking at to and working towards uh, in that regard? No, it's a great question. And the reality is, you know, to really solve this problem, it's going to take decades, considering how little we've invested in this space and how hard we've made it for exploration development companies to, to operate effectively in the U.S. However, with that being said, the great thing about our project and one of the major selling points when we took this asset on was how advanced it was. So the great thing is, you know, a lot of the work for to get this project to the feasibility study level, including the metallurgical studies, the environmental baseline studies, those have all been done, which means we have a much, much shorter timeline to potential production with this particular project. And that's one of the main things that we're trying to get out and, 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 and you know, in regards to the discussions with various U.S. departments. Um, we're trying to, you know, the, the, the plea we're trying to make is, hey, if we get funding, you know, non dilutive funding through the U.S. government, we can really even speed up that timeline even more. I mean, right now, um, based on a study that was done by the previous owner of this property um, and this development property, it was about a three year timeline to actually get this project from its current state into production. Um, and the reality is with additional funding through the U.S. government, that allows us to really fast track this thing even further. So, you know, the, the, the main pitch is, you know, we're not 10 years away. Because the reality is with how this geopolitical situation is increasing and rising and with, you know, China banning or starting to ban the export of, of graphite as of last weekend, you know, the reality is that the, the problem is is right now, it's today. You know, we can't solve this 10 years from now. We need a solution today. So that's how we fit into this whole model. Uh, and the reality is we think we can we can probably be in production um, in about three years time. Granted, we can get the funding we need through the U.S. government. And that, uh, you know, like I said, there's a there's a list of metals that the U.S needs to sort of um, really focus their attention on, because those are the ones that China has complete control over. Tungsten is one of those. And we think that we can be the solution within the U.S. with that with, as I mentioned, the largest and most 
advanced undeveloped tungsten deposit on U.S. soil. So we think we fit in very, very neatly and importantly into into this this movement that the U.S. is now making to um, reduce their reliance on China for a lot of these important metals. The principle that you outlined of uh, is a trend that we've been seeing a lot, and that's uh, basically edicts with dates attached to them coming out of Washington or other sometimes uh, international bodies saying that by this year, we're this going to have to accomplish this. By this year, we're going to have to accomplish this. And yet it seems to many observers using common sense that some of those uh, goals do not have the reality of uh, physics or engineering or the marketplace behind them in terms of like electrification of uh, the whole grid to support EVs and that sort of thing. And it needs to be upgraded entirely to be able to support that kind of thing. In this case, uh, the fact that that, that, that uh, goal has been set of achieving domestic supply and not accepting any uh, Chinese supply of tungsten into the U.S. Uh, for military purposes by January 26, I think you said. Uh, that seems like in a very aggressive timeline, and it sounds like what you're saying is that that's going to provide impetus or fuel to accelerate the development, the exploration development, uh, getting this getting this rolling. Are there other parts to that puzzle. Often we have uh, companies visiting us who talk about, well, we're going to have to build a road or we're going to have to build a power infrastructure or get access to the ports or rail lines or whatever in order to make this a viable uh, operating uh, scenario. How is the big picture, in addition to permitting and that's, and funding that you mentioned, uh, what, what bigger hurdles do you have to, and do you have uh, strategies on how you're going to get those bridges crossed as well? Yeah, and you know, I'm glad you asked because I think one of the other major selling points of this particular project when we took it on was how fantastic the, the current in-place infrastructure is. As you mentioned, a lot of these projects, you know, when you go to the lakes of Alaska um, or middle of you know Minnesota wilderness, you know, the reality is you might be 100, 200 kilometers away from the nearest power line, and on top of that, you're maybe 200 kilometers away from the nearest road. So when you when you look at that project in terms of how long is it going to take us to build this. And more importantly, what's the timeline? I mean, it's going to take you many, many years just to build the road and power infrastructure. And that's what makes some of these big projects, even though they're so fantastic up in Alaska, um, it makes them difficult because, you know, it's probably a 10 year, 10 year you know, timeline we're looking at and, and potentially, you know, billion plus in terms of CapEx just to build this, this project out. And that's where I think it's another major feather in the cap of our project, Pilot Mountain, and our company, Golden Metal Resources. The fact that, first of all, we are in Nevada. Nevada is number one ranked mining jurisdiction in the entire world. Uh, I used to live in Nevada. I, I lived in in, um, in northeast Nevada in Elko. I work for Barrick Gold, so it's a jurisdiction that I know really well. I used, to, you know, I have great connections there, great network there. It's it's one of the places, I've, one of the only places in the world really where I've worked. And you go to a local town, you know, you go to Winnemucca, you go to Elko. And it's it's everyone there is it's about mining. Everyone supports mining. They're glad you're there. You want they want you to make discoveries. They want this to go forward because there's ultimately means great paying jobs. So it's such a refreshing place to work because everywhere you go and every time I travel there, it, you know to be in these small towns and meet the local people uh, and tell them what you're doing. They're enthused and they want you there and they want you to have success. And that just means it's so much easier to push these things forward uh, and get the support of the locals to make these these major projects happen. But just to kind of loop back once again, the great thing is uh, there's, a, there's a town um, in, in about central Nevada, sort of halfway between Reno and Las Vegas. That's about 25 minutes away from our project, accessible by road. Um, on top of that, there's power lines that go within about five kilometers of our current claim boundary. So when it, you talk about road, you talk about power, you talk about water as well. There's water in the basin. That's a check, check, check when it comes to this project. On top of that, environmental baseline was done. There's no impediments to development. So a lot of these really important check boxes that these big projects projects in Alaska and in very remote places really struggle with. I mean, they've all been dealt with. And, and the, the reality is, it just means that the capex to get this project from its current state to development and mining goes from here, it's all the way down here. Um, and the previous owner that I mentioned, they put together a bit of a scoping study and, and a, a model as to what it would cost to put this project into production. Now, this was about five years ago, but that price tag was around $50 million. So when you look at some of the capexes of these big projects in, 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 in you know very remote places, I mean, we're talking a billion dollars. So that's another pitch that we can make to the U.S. government is not only if we get funding, can we speed up that timeline, but ultimately with a very small capex or relatively small capex, this project can be 
producing tungsten concentrate. And on top of that, it's probably worth note, noting to your listeners is we have an LOI optic agreement signed with a company called Global Tungsten and Powders. They're the largest tungsten processing company on US soil. They're located in the state of Pennsylvania. So ultimately, if we can produce the tungsten concentrate in that timeline, it can go directly to Global Tungsten and Powders where they can process it. And then that tungsten enters directly into the U.S. supply chain. So when, it, when you talk about a circular supply chain of these really important metals and defense metals like tungsten, we fit in perfectly. We just need to get the funding, hopefully through the U.S. government or with the funding that we have available to the capital markets to really allow us to, to, to achieve our goal here and get this project to that to that point where we can say, let's start digging. Yeah, it sounds like low hanging fruit in terms of the readiness or the, the the short timeline potential to production, which is not the same for all all potentials. Now, you mentioned something that that you learned about at a recent conference that you went that just came back from about what's happening in the graphite uh, supply chain. Can you talk to us about that and what that may foreshadow about what's likely to happen for tungsten? Yeah, of course. So the the first two metals that I believe have um, have been sort of the target of the of China uh, in terms of exports um, um, restrictions were actually germanium and gallium. Now those are two metals that um, go directly into chips, high tech chips. So those those two metals of which China controls, I believe, 100 um, percent, the export of those were actually banned, I think, about two months ago. Uh, and funny enough, very serendipitously, when I was actually flying back from the conference home, um, I was looking at Twitter and sure enough, China has announced the export um, or curbing the exports of, of graphite now from China to the U.S. And that's a specific target towards the electric vehicle industry because graphite is a really important uh, component in, in electric vehicle batteries. So now the question remains, okay, well, clearly this, this, this resource war is heating up. And what's potentially the next metal that the, uh, China could, could target here in terms of trying to really kind of, you know, get get the U.S. Can I hit, hit them where it hurts, right? Um, germanium, gallium, and graphite. Now the question is, what's next? Well, just a few kind of data points for your listeners. I'm just looking at my other screen here. But um, comparators between graphite and, and tungsten. So total Chinese annual production percentage-wise, graphite is 79%. Tungsten, as I mentioned, is actually 86 So there's a uh, China produces or has a larger stranglehold on the the uh, tungsten market than it does graphite. Um, flipping down here, total domestic primary production of graphite in the U.S. right now it's zero, and as I mentioned earlier, for tungsten it's also zero. And then the third thing is the percentage of Chinese imports into the U.S. annually, um, and that's about 33% for graphite and for tungsten. So a lot of comparisons between graphite and tungsten. And I think the major thing just to know here is graphite is, is as I mentioned, important input commodity into electric vehicles. But um, as I mentioned before, um, the fact that tungsten has significant military applications. So there's speculation that they're targeting certain parts of the U.S. supply chain and economy and potentially. And, and you can imagine with the current geopolitical situation um, in Israel and Palestine, as well as Ukraine and Russia, they might target a defense metal specifically. And tungsten is a really important defense metal um, because of its really high melting point. So it's not to say that they're going to ban the, the exports of tungsten. But if you look at some of those data points and some of those numbers, it's quite scary, uh, the position that the U.S. is in because they're so reliant on China. And that's where we ultimately think we can fit in here is we have the largest undeveloped project. It's on U.S. soil. It's in Nevada. It's relatively close to production. The capex is relatively low, so we think it's a really it's a home run of a story, uh, and we think it's a really important one to continue to evangelize and talk about, uh, you know, to U.S. investors in the U.S. market and U.S. government as well, um, because it's a really important part of allowing the U.S. to take back um, effectively their commodity independence. Well, people who follow this channel are very familiar with Rick Rule's mantra that if you want to be successful as an investor, position yourself ahead of time uh, to based on information that most people don't have uh, to where the interest is going to be. It sounds like what you're describing is a coming uh, crisis between uh, need and demand and policy regarding availability as well as sort of this geopolitical uh, restriction that's going to be choking off uh, the the supply, the foreign supply, and the need for a domestic supply for tungsten going forward. Uh, you, the other thing that's brand new here is the OTC listing. 
uh, which makes it easier for U.S. investors to take part in owning part of Golden Metal Resources. And if you talk to us about how people can find out more about that and what the ticker symbol is if they want to look into that. Yeah, of course. And just quickly, the, the way that this came about, done again, is, is when we were in Boca Raton at the, the Real Symposium, um, you know, I was talking to a lot of U.S.-based investors there about Golden Metal Resources and telling them what we were all about. And there's been a lot that's been transpired since then in making this project even more and more strategic. But the reality was anyone I told this story to, they go, this is amazing. This is this is the kind of thing that I want to invest in. This is the this is you know it's it's a it's very much a U.S. first. It's a homegrown story. We're looking to help the U.S. reduce their reliance on China for this really important uh, defense metal. So it's 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 a story that I think really resonated with the people that I spoke to in the U.S. and at Boca Raton, and that sort of spurred us to say we need to get. Uh, a U.S. OTC listing, so U.S. investors and listeners who who love what we're doing can ultimately get exposure. Um, and, and I'm proud to say that that listing was completed about two weeks ago. So as soon as we were at Boca, I got home and I got started on the process to get this company listed in the U.S. And we are happy to have that completed now. Um, the ticker for that, for our listing for Golden Metal Resources is G. MTLF as in golden metal and then F at the end. So it's a five letter ticker. Um, so you can you can pull up any of your stockbroking account now in the US and, and find our company. Um, we recently listed to so the market makers are still trying to figure out the spread and get a bit more stock available to buy, um, but certainly um, have it on your watch list. And uh, there's gonna be a lot of news coming out here about uh, what we're doing with the project uh, and various other developments across the portfolio. So I'm um, really happy to have the OTC listing live now. and. Uh, Obviously, it's a good time to talk to you and your listeners um, because you can, like I said, pull up any U.S. Uh, brokerage account now and get access to what we're doing here at Golden Metal. Okay, now I'm going to throw you a curveball. If it's focusing primarily on tungsten at this point, why the name Golden Metal Resources <laughs> in the title of the company? Uh, it's, that's a good question. So actually, um, long story short, we need to do a name change. When we first incorporated the business, it was before we were able to get our hands on this really important asset. Um, we have some other actual properties all in the state of Nevada. We have a really exciting gold property in northern Nevada, Carlin Gold, if your listeners are familiar with that, um, in the main trends that you find Barrick and Newmont and the, the big boys there. Um, so we do have a really exciting gold opportunity. We have a really exciting copper opportunity as well in the Walker Lane um, between Reno and Nevada, or sorry, Reno and Vegas as well. Um, but we brought in ultimately Pilot Mountain to be our flagship asset, which is tungsten and everything that I've learned about tungsten and the project in the two years since we've acquired it has just got me more and more excited about the potential here. But Golden Metal Resources was was to first signify the gold property that we acquired. Um, so probably a name change is in order. But as I mentioned, you know, you get access to the tungsten and exposure to our tungsten asset, which is all the reasons we discussed today, very, very strategic and important, but you also get access to a lot of great exploration properties in the portfolio as well and some gold, um, which I know your listeners um, are very bullish on as, um, as am I as well and copper as well. So a great plethora of assets in Nevada, but tungsten is the focus and probably a name change to U.S. critical metals or something like that is in order in the future. It sounds like as, as things um, devolve geopolitically, the list of critical metals that are not uh, readily available domestically and need to be developed in a hurry is going to probably increase. So uh, grateful for your presence in that space, uh, looking out for North America and our needs, as well as uh, it was great meeting you in person at the Rural Symposium and having you back for the first time as a returning guest on our channel. And uh, grateful for your presence here. We've been speaking with Oliver Friesen. He's the CEO of Golden Metal Resources. And uh, Oliver, thanks for joining us on Liberty and Finance. Yeah, thanks for the time, everyone. And let's chat again soon. Uh, I'll get everyone up to speed as to what we've transpired and what's happened in the, in the months since. So looking forward to catching up again soon. Looking forward to that as well. Thank you.